All right, we're here for the last class of Adventure Racing 101. I'm Emily. I'm Earl. And uh, we're a couple minutes before seven, so we'll just give everybody time to um, be here. Again, this is Adventure Racing 101 in the year 2020, everybody's favorite year of all time. Uh, class number four, this is our last one um, of the like in-person virtual classes. And then um, starting on November 7th, we'll have some uh, in-person group training, like actually with a map and compass, and you'll able, be able to go out and find some checkpoints. So um, we'll give everybody a couple minutes um, while we're waiting for everybody to kind of join in that's going to join in. Earl, do you want to give us a ankle update? Ankle update. So today I had an opportunity to uh, an appointment with my surgeon, and it was a pretty exciting day. Uh, I had my cast removed, and Yay! we uh, took x-rays, and all the x-rays look good, and it's healing like it's supposed to, and now I'm in a walking boot, per se, um, but it still pretty much comes all the way up from the tip of my toe to my knee. Um, the highlights are is that I can be 50% weight bearing on it and then a week from today I should be able to be 100% weight bearing so that's pretty exciting and I can actually take it off to sleep and to shower so those are some pretty there's a big day today got a long ways to go but this will be like I've been on crutches for almost seven weeks now and so when you shower, it'll be the first time your foot has been in a shower for like basically two months. Since before Labor Day. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, almost it'll be eight weeks on Thursday. Yeah. So, but they uh, did a nice like alcohol wash on my leg and between my toes today. So that was pretty good too. You feel like right. so fresh and so clean? Right. We got a little wound cleanup to do, but we'll get that. Yeah. Cool. So again, everybody, if you see Earl on race day, um, maybe we'll have some crutches. There should be no crutches, but I'll probably still potentially be in some sort of, I don't know, I have my, my appointment on the 23rd of November, and so that's one month from today. Um, might be an issue. I don't know. We'll yeah. find out. That was the doctor's goal is possibly a shoe so so just give him a high five if you see him on race day he didn't tell me to bring a shoe <laughs> he didn't tell me to bring a shoe though oh, so yeah um, next time maybe well maybe i'll just bring it to motivate it right yeah be like by the way i have this yeah, shoe i brought here. my shoe with <laughs> awesome worn. um okay so i think we'll get going um we have our favorite run like the winded team providing the audio visual checkup so thank you run like the winded i really appreciate your um dedication that we've been doing your our av checks every time um so i'm going to kind of open up the comments so if anyone has any comments just like normal uh or questions just chime in um and we'll i have a computer here off the screen so um, we'll get to your comments just as they come up. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about, uh, for our last class, class number four, we're going to talk about nutrition and race day strategy. So two kind of like maybe not so uh, like gear oriented topics, but very important nonetheless. So um, let's just jump in. Um, so nutrition, you got to eat. Uh, this is an eight hour race. Um, basically how we design the course every year is that the, the winning team and the winning time will be about uh, generally between four and five hours. Sometimes it's like three and a half to four and a half, but we just generally try to get that winning time um, in the four hour range. Um, so if you're a team that, you know, you've done this race before and you've been in that top 10, top 20 position, you can kind of estimate that's how long your race is going to take. If you're a new team, um, plan to take the whole time. Um, we're going to have a fun, hopefully a fun, kind of chill, pretty challenging course again this year. Last year was pretty tough, um, but we think we've got a good one brewing for 2020. So um, that's kind of the, the time range that you should be expected to be out there. So four hours on the short side and 
eight hours on the long side, I think, yeah, eight hours. Um, <laughs> it's an eight hour race. Anything more, anything more than eight, we probably have to have some conversations, but uh, yeah, we need everybody home by eight, eight, right. eight hours, otherwise it's dark and yeah. we don't want to have to come looking for people, so make sure we're home by eight. Right. Um, so the reason I mentioned kind of that expected time frames is that's how I'll, I'll talk through my nutrition strategy and then Earl will talk through his because they're very different and um, you can learn a little bit from both. So how I do it is, uh, how I do nutrition is I basically take an expected time that my team's race is going to take and then I calculate uh, the number of calories per hour that I'm pretty comfortable that my body can handle and then, you know, then it's a math equation of uh, number of hours expected race, number of calories per hour equals number of calories that I need to bring along. Um, and from there, I, I guess like full disclosure, I'm an engineer um, by training. I love Excel. Anything to has, that has to do with Excel, it's like way preferable than any Word document or PDF or anything like that. So um, I have like when I first started racing, I created this big spreadsheet that was like, okay, race time, calories per hour, uh, so then here's my total number of calories and then to break it out with 50% um, carbohydrates and 25% fat and 25% protein. So then I'd have caloric goals by macros and then I'd like go look up packages of Oreos and see how much like carb, fat, protein those would have or jerky or um, Cliff Bar or you know all those sorts of things. So I had like built this amazing spreadsheet and then I would pick and choose what I was gonna to bring to each race based on those caloric targets. Um, I haven't, I've kind of like strayed a little bit from that approach in the last few years, um, mostly because I've kind of like, that spreadsheet really helped me get a- I, I dumbed her down a little yeah. bit, <laughs> stressed me out. Yeah, it was kind of stressful. I, well, I wasn't stressed, but Earl was. And, but I also like really learned from it. So I just got a handle on, okay, like, this is kind of the feel of what I need to be bringing to these races. So um, just that, I just mentioned it because I know a lot of engineers like to do adventure races. And um, if you're a spreadsheet type of person, just maybe consider playing around with one of those um, to build out your race nutrition plan. So that's one option. Here's another option. I figure one of the, something about a bar about this size, one an hour, something like this size, two an hour. Um, for basically, is what I'll do is I'll take um, like a, a Ziploc sandwich bag, sandwich bag size, and put, you know, four to six pieces in it or whatever I can kind of fill that in, and I call that good enough for six hours. So for, uh, you know, and then just kind of balance it between my bento and I'll just normally fill up my bento because that way it really doesn't, it's not a lot of extra weight. Are you going to a sushi restaurant in the middle of an adventure race? We talked about this on the bike. <laughs> so this is a bento box that what you can put on your bike. So you can put multiple pieces of food in there. Um, but yeah, I try not to overthink it too much, but basically uh, a bar an hour or, you know, supplement with like a sandwich or a tortilla with some peanut butter and honey, peanut butter and jelly, turkey and cheese, um, we use the Hawaiian bread, you know, um, eight hours we're probably not going to be carrying a lot of like real food, um, but you also want to kind of have some stuff supplement, supplemented. So, um, and then it's not uncommon to just have somebody maybe on your team have your, um, somebody's watch scheduled to ping every hour with an alarm and then it's like, hey, okay, the alarm went off, everybody should eat something or, and then just kind of have that, you know, you kind of need everybody, you know, whether you're a two person team or a four person team, somebody just kind of needs to be the food and med not Nazi and just say, okay, make sure everybody's eating and drinking um, because it's really easy um, to all of a sudden be two hours in and there's just so much going on in the first couple hours so you just totally space off eating and drinking. Um, especially if it's kind of gonna be a cooler day um, and you can really, even though it's going to be a, let's just say a 35 to a 45 degree day, you can still get dehydrated really easy on those days just because you're wearing a little more clothes. You wouldn't think that's possible, but it really is um, actually more possible to get dehydrated on some of those cooler days versus 
um, some of the warmer days. So just it's very important to just make sure you keep eating and drinking, and then you know just kind of. And then when you're out training, just kind of keep an eye on how much food you eat, um, and then you know it's. I don't know. We'll get ready. Get, get into the pre-race meals at some point in time too, but. Um, just what about drinking? What do you drink? How do you drink? Okay, so normally on the race course, I will have I'll carry a, I'll have a three liter bladder. Pretty much, pretty much all I own are three liter bladders. I might have a couple two liters that I'll put in my PFDs, but pretty much everything I own is a three liter. And you know, depending on the temperature and stuff, I would probably fill for an eight hour race. I'd probably fill it two thirds full. Um, you know, and this is just like fair warning. Earl is a person that drinks. I drink a lot. I, I have a lot of like, fluids. Yeah. So, um, I, Me, I, I like don't drink a ton, but Earl, it's like very important for his personal happiness and athletic performance to drink right. a lot of water. And, and I guess I've normally, I've probably times I carry more water than I need to, but mentally it just makes me physically stronger just to have that not worry about that not running out, which is probably a bad thing, but. Um, and then I always run just plain water in my bladder because if you ever, for me, I've had funny tummies and if there's something other than water in my bladder, it just doesn't bode well. So if I'm going to, if we're doing something where I need to have, you know, um, some scratch or some different sort of hydration, I'll always carry like a smaller bottle of that in a side pouch of my pack. Um, and then I'll, you know, but for like an eight hour race, I'd pretty much put my electrolyte drink on my bike and then just drink water on the on the trek and in the boat and then um, have electrolyte tablets with as well to supplement um, that mm -hmm. um, okay so those are kind of food, some food strategies some water strategies I follow the same thing as Earl does um, just plain water in a bladder you know with a hose that's easily accessible and then if you're gonna have any type of sports drink, um, Gatorade, Scratch, Sword, Tailwind, like there's, pick your flavor. Um, I just like to keep that in bottles uh, just so that you always have like kind of those two options. And then also I think it makes cleanup a little bit easier after the race is over. It's kind of easier to throw those water bottles in a dishwasher or wash them in a sink. Um, and then your bladders can air dry and then it's just easier to keep them longer. Um, so kind of just some things to like also help the like mechanics of eating because it's one thing to like have the food that you want to eat with you um, but then it's another thing to be able to actually access it during the race um, and like get it into your mouth so that it works for you um, so one of the things is to just make sure that you have a plan for accessing your food probably the most reliable um, thing to do is have something or have these uh, amazing like shoulder or sorry gosh hip here I'll, I'll demonstrate right now yeah so this is a why don't you start over this that don't work real well. oh no no I got it I got it so this is Earl's pack it's a little bit large for me um, but so if you guys can see here he's got the hip pouches full of ooh there's actually snacks in here so we've got uh, Cliff Bar, a oh. couple paydays. Um, oh, you know what? The, the last time I packed that for? Oh, this is. <laughs> that's the day I went down. The day of the broken ankle. Yes. This is what you we were planning to eat, or he was. So, anyway, um, hip pouches just really make uh, your food accessible when you're really anytime during the race. So, trekking or biking, um, you'll have it with you. And then, if you have your pack on while you're paddling, then it's easy to get to also. And then we also like these shoulder pouches. These are just some that we bought. They don't come with the pack, but um, you can buy them like after market and they just go on your, um, your pack strap right there. So then again, that's just like more area for you to store snacks. It, I like to use one of these pockets for my garbage so that it's always like in one little area. You can put your compass in here, just like a variety of items um, for these shoulder pouches or if you can fit everything in like an ultra running vest, those typically have a lot of nice shoulder pouches too. So um, just think about how you're gonna have your food accessible before the race. Um, don't just throw it all in a dry bag and put it in your main pack compartment and then 
right? And you have to stop. And then, and then if you have a pack, hold that for a minute. If you have a pack that you can't get like all the food to where it's accessible for you in the hip pouches, put it in this kangaroo pouch in the back. You can't access it, but your teammate can. So you're like, hey, can you grab me some food? And they can just grab it out of the back and pass it forward so you don't have to take your pack on and off to access food. So you just want to keep it available. The other thing is, is that if your hands are cold, these are going to be kind of hard to open. So I like to pre-open some stuff. You know, if you're going to know you're going to, you know you're going to eat some things. So it doesn't hurt to just kind of pre-pop them so that they're a little bit easier to eat. Um, if you're going to be going paddling, you don't really want anything open other than the stuff you, you know, because you don't want river water or whatever on it. But, you know, going into a bike, especially on your bike, um, you might want a couple pieces open for that. Um, it's probably the most important time to do that, but. Mm -hmm. And speaking of like paddling versus biking food, um, there's also some kind of types of food that work better for different sections of the adventure race. So um, what I kind of like to visualize is picture a bag of peanut M&Ms and then a bag of Oreos, let's say. So the calories per piece of peanut M&M, it's gonna be like kind of small, maybe, I don't know, 10 or 20 calories per thing. Order your spreadsheet. I'll, yeah, I need to go reference my spreadsheet. Um, whereas the calories per piece of an Oreo or calories per piece of a Snicker bar or a Cliff bar is like much higher. So um, what I, where I'm trying to get at is like, if you're, doing a sport, either paddling or mountain biking, that you really need your hands for something else, um, consider bringing like those kind of larger pieced items, like a cliff bar, a sandwich that you can take a huge bite of, um, something like that, and then leave these smaller items, like M&Ms, gummy bears, trail mix, um, sports beans, stuff like that, leave those for trekking, because then you have your hands free to kind of like, you know, feed yourself as you go, um, Skittles, it's just the small stuff like that, keep that for trekking. Um, those are also kind of something fun to do, like if your team is maybe struggling a little bit, um, if you have a bag of peanut M&Ms, just be like, okay, we're gonna all share one peanut M&M every checkpoint we find, or you know, just something like that that's a little game that um, you can share with your team and kind of help keep everybody's spirits up. So small pieces for trekking, big pieces for paddling and biking. You can eat big pieces while you're trekking too. Yeah, or that, yeah. <laughs> so, right. um, okay, so we talked about keeping your food accessible. Um, we talked a little bit about hydration. Um, one just thing to mention is our race is in December, so it could be very cold. Um, the race is a rain or shine, freezing, above freezing type event. So um, if it is below freezing and you have a hydration bladder with a tube, it's really easy for water in that tube to freeze while you're running around at warp speed. So um, if that, you know, there's multiple ways that you can solve that. One is, you know, there's an accessory from uh, Camelback or any other hydration um, bladder manufacturer that's just like an insulated cover to that hydration tube. Um, so you can pick one of those up and see if it helps. Um, generally we don't mess around with those too much because we just like shove the tube inside our shirt so it's like if you had a hydration um, bladder kind of coming over here and it was frozen you just like unzip your fleece or unzip, unzip your raincoat and shove that tube down into your shirt and then your body heat will help warm it up um, and then after you're done drinking make sure to blow like blow into your hydration bladder so that all the water goes back into the bladder in your pack and it doesn't stay in that tube because once you freeze water in the tube, uh, it's just really hard to break that loose. Um, so yeah, just be aware of the temperature and you know the freezing point of water and all those little science facts um, play a part in a successful adventure race. Um, okay, if you have any um, like prescription medications also make sure that you're like have a plan to take those just because you're in a race doesn't mean you can not take a prescription so um, plan for those if you have any um, we've have, have had a couple of racers with diabetes that need to like monitor their insulin so 
Um, just be, have a plan for all of that. If, if there's anything that we can do as a race organization to help you manage um, one of those conditions, we're happy to do it. So just get in touch with us and we'll help you out. Um, and then any other uh, like over-the-counter type meds that your team likes, um, like ibuprofen, e-caps, um, caffeine, like any sort of like those little items. Um, by e-caps, I mean like a salt pill or an electrolyte tablet. Um, just make sure you have kind of those accessible too if you plan on using them. Um, and then, let's see, just with all of these wrappers, you know, that are kind of everywhere, uh, littering is disqualification. We, are, like, it's just like, it's a bad habit, it's harmful to the areas that we race in, um, and we just don't tolerate it. So, you need to have a plan to keep all of these wrappers stashed away in a pocket, um, a zipper pouch, part of your pack. Um, just make sure you don't you know, leave a trail of where you've been, of where you've been, because um, we don't support littering in any form. Right. So yeah, you make sure it's secure. A lot of people will have like, take one of their hip pouches and des designate that as the garbage can. Make sure the garbage can gets zipped up every time you're opening and closing it. And, and you know, watch your teammates. All, I mean, whether it's the garbage can or your teammates food, you know, just kind of keep looking at each other's packs to make sure that all the zippers are always closed because Sometimes you get in a hurry and you forget, or sometimes they just open up. Um, so, you know, monitor each other's team, or if one of your teammates is walking and you're, all of a sudden there's trash on the ground, you know, just pick it up and then do an inventory of what's going on with your team. And if you see stuff on the ground, just pick it up, please. Yep. Um, okay, and then kind of the, that's all like the in the race type nutrition. Um, Maybe one last advice that I would say um, for tackling nutrition during a race is if you all of a sudden, like, it's very common to kind of be in the middle of the race and like search in your pockets and you're like, oh, I only have two Snickers and a granola bar left. I really, that doesn't really sound good. I need something like salty. Like tell your teammates that, right. hey, does anyone have any pretzels or crackers or cold pizza um, and ask around because it's almost like it's almost every race that my teammates food for whatever reason like sounds better and tastes better than the food that I brought and then kind of same for them you know like we share food back and forth so um, don't be afraid to ask your teammates to share some of their your food or their food um, make sure to offer to share yours um, it's just you know, it kind of keeps anything to keep the whole team as a unit moving forward with the supplies that you have. Um, take advantage of that. Um, okay, so that's kind of all the in-race stuff. Um, we're going to talk a little bit now about race day strategy. Well, we're actually going to talk about uh, the day before the race strategy, things you need to do, and then actual race day strategy. Um, so the night before the race. We're gonna have packet pickup at Alpine Shop Kirkwood. Um, it's uh, basically 270 and 44, kind of a little bit um, northeast of that for anyone who's coming in from out of town. Um, so we'll have packet pickup starting at 4 p.m. at the Alpine Shop in Kirkwood. Um, so you'll come to the shop, you'll get your packet, which has basically your map or maps for the race. It'll have a clue sheet in it. It'll have any swag or sponsor items that we are able to give away. Um, and uh, typically we have a coupon in there also for Alpine Shop. So those are kind of the main things that you'll get. We recommend, um, you know, as close as you can till f at, to the packet pickup opening. So as close as you can till 4 o'clock. Uh, make sure to stop by and grab your packet. Uh, we, just, we might need to stay, stagger that a little bit, though, due to COVID. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So we'll, uh, We're still working on that we'll, plan. We'll, we'll get back to you. We might have to go to assigned window times, potentially, just because we can't. Well, you know, we're, we're still working on those items. But in, in a normal year, that's what we did. But, you know, we might have to do some time assignments or something as we get. We'll, get, we'll keep you posted on that. But just plan on your packet pickup sometime between 4 and 7 or okay. whatever that time is, and we'll we'll have a race announcement of how we're going to handle that. But 
Um, and we might be an outside pickup just so that we can keep people social distance too. So we're, we're working through it. Right. Yes. Many details. Um, so as early as you're available to pick up your packet, come pick it up. Um, because you'll have some plotting to do the night before the race. So that's a UTM plotting. It's a, I'll tell you the scale. It's either going to be a 1 to 24,000 or 1 to 15. Um, some are, you, you know, those are the two scales that we typically use for the maps for this race. Um, so you'll have uh, probably at least 20 checkpoints to plot, maybe up to 30. Um, so if you're not practiced in UTM plotting, maybe now's a good time. And our race website actually has all of the maps and the clue sheets from previous years. So if you need something to practice with, um, they're available on the race website. Um, so we just want to give you as much time as possible to kind of get through that process of plotting your checkpoints, um, planning out your route, marking down any you know useful pieces of information on your map that you want. Um, just kind of, you know, there's a lot of those kinds of details to do. So uh, make sure to give yourself plenty of time to do all of your map work the night before. Um, and if we give you multiple maps, make sure to plot every CP that you can on every map that you have. So typically our arrangement is we'll have kind of one larger master map with all of the checkpoints or most of the checkpoints on it. And then you may have a couple smaller, more detailed maps for sections where like maybe the trails are all close together and we need to you know, blow it up for you to see. Or um, maybe an orienteering section that's on a separate orienteering map. Um, so it's not good enough to just plot your checkpoints on the one master map. Like if you have two maps available and map two has you know, the 10 orienteering checkpoints on it, make sure to plot those on both maps. Um, just so that you can have all of that information available on whatever map you think is most helpful at the time during the race. Um, and then after you get your checkpoints marked on there, uh, make sure you're you know matching up with your clue sheet to make sure you know um, which ones are paddling checkpoints, which ones are biking checkpoints, which ones are foot trekking checkpoints, um, because you need to follow those three disciplines on how you would visit each checkpoint. Um, you can't ride your bike to a paddling checkpoint and punch it and have it count. Um, that's against the rules. So just need to make sure you're paying attention on the clue sheet to what mode of travel to use. Um, and then you're welcome to, if you want to do any other sort of decoration or arts and crafts with your maps, if you want to fire up Google Maps and like look at the road names and write the road names on your map, you're welcome to do that. If you want to measure um, like you know, in between turns, it's 1.2K here, and then we turn left, and then it's 600 meters, and then we turn right. Like, you're welcome to write a whole novel on your map if you want the night before. Um, that's just, it's up to you what information you want to have with you. Um, because during the race, you're not allowed to have any other extra maps. So you can't bring, um, obviously, like, no GPS maps. That's obviously against the rules. Um, you can't bring, like, uh, no supplemental maps. Yeah, super secret special like uh, park map that you just happen to have. Like you can't do that. So you need to all the information that you need. You need to mark it on the race maps, um, and we give you plenty of time to do that. So that's for Friday night. Um, if you want to waterproof your maps, you, you can do that. Maybe using some contact paper, or if you're comfortable with, with comfortable with your waterproof map case, then you won't need to do that. We We'll print at least the big map, the master map on waterproof paper. So it holds up pretty well, um, but it's not like impenetrable. So if you take your waterproof map and put it on the bottom of your canoe and like let it swish in the river silt water and people step on it, like it's gonna fade, the ink's gonna go away. So um, if you wanna make sure to protect your maps, do that on Friday night. Um, and then have a good dinner. Um, you don't need to like, well, this is always like personal preference. Personally, I don't feel like I need to go crazy with like a carb loading dinner. Um, I do like a couple pieces of pizza the night before the race. Um, but in general, just kind of like a normal dinner with foods that you're, that you know, and you're comfortable with. Uh, what else the night before the race? Uh, night, the night before, a couple of things is that um, 
You're going to want to work out a strategy for in the morning. Uh, you might, you know, as, as we get closer to the race, we might, you know, give you some more information. But, you know, if there's a bike drop, you know, strategize, are we going to carpool to the, to the bike drop? Who's going to haul the bikes? Um, you know, get that organized. Again, with the bikes, make sure the bikes are getting ready now, not Friday night. So if you need any services, we talked about that last week, but make sure your bikes are getting serviced or ready to go or whatever you need to do. Um, so, you know, bike drop, um, make sure that you have a full tank of gas um, and then plan your breakfast for in the morning. Um, Cause you know, depending on where the race starts, you know, some of you guys might have a 45 minute to an hour drive one way and you know, to stop and get gas is going to take you another five to ten minutes and then you know those kind of things can snowball and all of a sudden you're further behind than what you wanted to do and the best thing to do to get your race started out um, with the right foot forward is be there early be there organized have your team all ready together so that when it's time to go you're not all trying to figure out where stuff is or who's missing or whatever so just having a plan of being early even though you're early, you still might be late. I mean, we're always trying to plan <laughs> earlier than what we are. We're always still the last team on the start line. It's just silly, but it's just the way it is. Um, so, you know, just make sure you have those things. The other thing is, is you might want to plan, you know, have a breakfast when you get up. You're probably gonna get up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. The race doesn't start till eight, but you know you're gonna wanna have at least something to eat on the, in the car on the way over and then maybe you're gonna have another light snack or something before you start the race and if you start off if you start out topped off you might be able to go the first two hours without really worrying about any food and drink you know um, and that's kind of a nice way to start you know but if all of a sudden you get up late and you forget to have breakfast and then you forget your snack and you're 20 minutes in and it's like oh shoot I'm starving and then you start di dipping into your food which is fine and some people like to go that way, but it's, you know, if you can start out with your, you know, a good dinner and a good breakfast, your tank is pretty full to start out with. Um, okay, so we, we're gonna take a little bit of a break. We have some questions um, from the comments, and then we'll jump into like a race day strategy. Um, so first question, not really about nutrition, but we'll allow it. So this one is from Mark, um, and I'm gonna let you answer this one, Earl. So, Earl. Do you still wear thin wool socks even when the temperature drops? My smart wool socks did great this past weekend. I'm wondering if the same so socks would still work. What yep. do you think? Any sock that works, I guess I don't know. I, I don't know how thick they were, but it, I mean, if they work for you this weekend, they probably would work great for you as well um, for the Castlewood race, you know. Um, once you find something that works for you, just kind of stick with it. Um, so yeah, I, mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, I'm assuming this is a question from Mark, and I'm assuming Mark, you meant the off-road rage um, adventure race in Warsaw, and uh, so there we had I think temperatures like 40, like mid 30s at the start, mid 40s, maybe up into the low 50s during the race. Um, and yeah, if you can wear that same pair of socks and it always helps to keep your feet dry, but tradition or, you know, kind of normally in these shorter races, there'll be enough transitions where you're switching disciplines frequently. Like I was at the off-road rage race as well. And I wore the same pair of socks and shoes the whole time. And my feet were cold when we went from biking to trekking, like the first you know, five or 10 minutes, I was like, oh, I'm just walking on frozen feet, but they warm up and it's really definitely was worth, you know, not having to take the time to change um, all the time and transition. So um, yeah, I think if you found a sock that works for you, like hold on to it, use it again, right. um, keep going. That sock might even work on an 80 and 90 degree day. I know people that wear, you know, kind of a heavier wool sock than what I would ever wear on an 80, 90 degree day, but it works for them. So. Um, and for me, a uh, lighter weight sock works better for me when it's cold because if my feet are wet, they just dry out faster. So um, everybody has their own preferences on how that works. 
Um, okay, next question. This one's from Scott. Will there be places to refill water bladders? Um, basically, no. Uh, we have, we won't provide any water at the um, transition areas ourselves. Like, it's just, it's too big of a burden for our race organization to provide coolers of water for 300 racers. Um, so you need to be prepared to be self-sufficient for the entire time. Um, there may be like public water spigots available. You're welcome to use those. And if we know of any, we'll point them out or you know make sure racers are aware like, oh, we're at a park that has running water. You're welcome to use it. Um, and pretty much every park has had their water faucets all shut off all summer. So um, due to COVID, everything's been turned off anyway. So. Um, you know, normally we could say yes, sometimes the parks have it, but normally we do once the weather, if it's cold, they turn them off, but pretty much all the parks, any public water source seems like it's been turned off since March. So, um, you know, there'll be opportunities to pull water, um, and you can treat it, or if you're going by a gas station or something by some chance, you could go buy water there, but just plan on having enough water to start and finish the race. Yep. And so that's kind of a follow up question from Michael. He was looking at the maps from 2019 Castlewood, and there is like some shopping areas on or very close to the course last year. Um, and he wants to know, are we allowed to stop and get extra supplies? Um, the answer is yes. You can use any source of public aid um, that you'd like. So that includes gas stations, restaurants, hotels. <laughs> if you need a shower in the middle of an eight-hour race, like whatever, bring a credit card. Um, Anything like that that's like public and unplanned, um, you're welcome to use. What we uh, don't allow is like pre-planned aid. So that means you can't um, like drop a jug of water before the, you know, like on your way to the race, like, oh, hey, let's drop this jug of water in the woods and then we can use it during the race and our packs will be lighter. Like that's cheating. So you can't pre-stash supplies. Um, for the adventure race, and then you also can't like happen to run into your kindergarten teacher who has freshly baked cookies for you on the course. Um, that type of like that's pre-planned aid. So unless um, you share them with everybody, right? Unless you bring us like 600 cookies, two for everybody. Uh, that's yeah, that's that, that's a good point. If you happen to arrange an aid station, an unofficial aid station that's able to serve everybody in the race. Um, have at it. Maybe let us know and we'll even help you, you know, recommend a place where you can put it. Um, but otherwise, no, you can't just like organize to like see somebody in their van and they give you a McDonald's hamburger or something like that's not allowed. Um, so again, any public unplanned aid from a store, a water spigot, a, you know, a, a person who has a house on the race course just happens to be in their yard and they have a hose, like you can definitely go up and ask for water from them. Um, anything like that, that's fair game, but just no pre-stashing of food or gear and no meetups from friends or family that are pre-arranged. Um, okay, I think that's it. Do we, oh, question from Katie. Do we need to blue bag solid waste? Do you need to poop, put your poop in a bag, is your question. Um, really, no. The, dig, dig a foxhole. Yeah, just dig a little hole if you need to poop during the race and there's not a like vault toilet or, you know, because we are going through some parks that have those, that if there's a vault toilet, it'll be open. Um, but yeah, if you need to like use the bathroom during the race, like if you're peeing, just like pee and don't leave any toilet paper there. Um, but if you're pooping, we're, we're just gonna go into detail about this. Just dig a little hole, um, dump poop in it, and then um, cover it up and go on your way. But just don't leave toilet paper in the woods um, and make sure you just cover up um, any solid waste so that no one else steps in it. That's just rude. Um, anything else? Any peeing and pooping tips while we're talking uh, about it? It's best to do that. I mean, you know, again, we are guests doing a race. So, you know, just use some social discretion of, you know, just what you normally do is if you're out in the woods, it's okay to peep and pee and poop in the woods. 
Um, but, you know, be discreet about it. And if you need to pee and poop in a public space, man, just hold prefer, it. Just prefer that you don't do it or be discreet somehow. But, right. uh, yeah. Or if you're on like a country road, like just be aware of where the houses are. Like, that's just also very rude to use somebody's front yard as your toilet. Um, so. Good question though. Like this is something that I thought about a lot during before my first race. Like, what do I have to go to the bathroom? I don't know. Um, so yeah, just um, take care of your own business. Don't leave any trace behind of toilet paper, and then um, just don't make it a public event. And we will have, you know, dep depending on where the race start is, you know, we'll try to have a few portalettes, or there might be some public restrooms or something there, but. Um, again, we're going to have 300 people, and so we're not going to have 100 porta potties. We might have like three or four. So, any business that you can take care of before you get there, start your coffee early or whatever you need to do to do your morning routine, start the process and kind of have it knocked out before you get there. I mean, we'll have stuff available, but you know, again, it's an outdoor event. Yep, totally. Um, okay, so let's go into some race day strategy. And again, if you guys, like, you're doing really good questions, so just type them in um, whenever you got something, and then we'll um, work it into our little chat. Um, so race day. Uh, it's going to be early. So the race starts at 8 o'clock, um, but we'll have a pre-race meeting at 7, I think it's 7.30. We have our pre-race meeting. Um, and there's really nothing that exciting that typically happens at the 7:30 meeting it's just um you know making sure everybody's there and uh if there's any you know like major announcements we'll also like double post those on facebook the night before um but really we just want to have everybody gathered in the same place um we're working on a totally outdoor situation for the um this year's 2020 course so we're not going to have any indoor spaces available to like hang out, leave your clothes. So you just need to be really prepared to be outdoors for the entire day. Um, we might have like a couple pavilions with maybe some roofs, but even that's kind of up for grabs. So um, just really plan to be outdoors the whole time, no matter what the weather is. So we'll have a pre-race meeting um, in the morning. We'll do the national anthem. We will uh, hand out passports in the morning. So that's our basically our attendance system to know which teams actually, show, even if you picked up your packet, you might have looked at the map the night before and be like, screw this, it's not what I signed up for, and then not even show up at the start. So we don't want to be like looking for a team who's not there. So we hand out passports in the morning, um, and that's, your, that's our attendance system to know which teams are actually on the course during the day. Um, and then uh, I'm still working on a strategy for master maps. So typically what we do, and I, I have an idea about this, but um, so typically what we do is in the morning of the race, we have at least two master maps that show all of the checkpoints. So this is to help the new teams who are just maybe UTM plotting for the first time on Friday night. Um, we wanna give them an opportunity to double check their work and make sure that they didn't um, like make an error and then that would just cause their race to be miserable for the whole day. So. Um, we typically have master maps that you can check in the morning or I'm working on like a digital version of those so that uh, I mean it's not ideal because it's kind of hard to check from like a phone or a computer screen onto your paper map um, but I think that'll be the best way to keep everybody spread out at the beginning um, in the morning so we'll have a, a master map in some form um, that you'll be able to double check your plots make sure that you're going to the right um, checkpoint locations um, and then, yeah, like I said, we'll kind of have our uh, little meeting. We'll do the anthem. Typically, we have a couple more minutes after that of just downtime. You can take your jackets off, leave them at the um, HQ or wherever we're starting at. Well, you'll know if we're starting remotely or not um, based on um, the maps the night before. So you can shed any extra layers and then just get ready for the start. Um, then once the... Once we say go, then the really the magic happens. Um, so what are some important things to remember immediately, like in the first five to 10 minutes of the race? Oh, always know where your teammates are. It's your main 
that is your main objective is to have a strategy have the navigator have a strategy strategy of where you're going and then also just being able to have a visual of where your teammates are um, this year might be a little bit easier to manage that because we probably won't be doing a we'll be doing some sort of social distanced start so you're not going to have 300 people towing the line together and taking off at the same time so that will be a little bit more manageable but still um, you want visual I mean it's the rules um, you know and then just have a strategy of where you're gonna go and it's just really easy to get caught up in the excitement especially for our rookie racers we have over a hundred rookie racers this year which is like our biggest um, contingent ever so yay rookies um, but it's just really easy to get excited, like, oh my gosh, I'm in my first adventure race, this is so great. And then you get caught up in all of it, and then all of a sudden, like, you can't see where your teammates are. So just make sure to, like, kind of keep your head right about you and make sure you keep tabs on where your teammates are. Just, just know, you know, if maybe everybody's wearing a blue shirt, or, you know, if you're wearing a blue shirt, somebody's got a red shirt, somebody's got a yellow shirt, just know what your teammates are wearing and that will just make it easier, you know, if somebody's got a bright green hat or, you know, whatever, you know, some teams come with amazing costumes, so those guys got to figure it out, right. but, mm -hmm. you know, do something so that, you know, it's easy for you to all kind of recognize each other, um, especially if you haven't been racing together much or really are just kind of get, getting going together, have something that you can both identify as yourselves with make that recognition a little bit easier. And some really good advice in the comments from legendary Randy Erickson, don't forget to breathe after the start. Right. Like just keep breathing and you'll make it. <laughs> that, that's, that is the, that's gonna get you through the day. Two things is, or three things, breathing mm -hmm. and then one foot in front of the other and just keep making a step or keep pedaling, or keep paddling, and then smile the best you can, and have fun, and it'll be a successful Man, These are day. like four steps. I know, but it's a sentence of amazing. <laughs> it'll get you through the day. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay. watching. Right, yeah, we have- Hey, Randy. Wow, we have Randy here. Um, so hopefully we can all, you guys can all meet Randy um, on December 5th. He'll be the one piloting the drone. Um, He's our awesome, one of our awesome media team. We've got a really, we're so lucky to have a really great media team. Um, okay, so we've got, we've, we've got you ready for the race. We've got you started. Now you're five minutes into the course. Um, something to pay attention to is what your team is doing and not what other teams are doing. Um, because especially with our uh, format this year of like, want, we wanna spread people out uh, as far as possible and as fast as possible. So that may mean that people go to different checkpoints right off the start. Um, so you need to really make sure that your navigator is clear on which checkpoint to go to first. And then also you need to make sure to be sticking with your navigator and following that person and going with your team instead of being like, oh, but those people in the green shirts, they're going over there, maybe we should follow them. Like they might be going to a totally different area of the course. That, or they're just lost. Or they're lost too, like you never you know. know. <laughs> so um, just always make sure to be focused on your team's plan and following your team and not really uh, like, you know, thinking like the grass is greener on the other side of the adventure racing fence um, with another team of where they're going because you just, you don't know what's up with their navigation strategy. Um, and then uh, okay, so that's kind of like you've gotten going, you've got a good rhythm get down, maybe you've got your first like six or seven checkpoints, uh, maybe your first TA. So the next thing that you need to start paying attention to is if there's any cutoff times in play. Um, so we typically have one or two mid-race cutoffs um, that are in the middle of the race, um, in addition to the finishing cutoff of 4 p.m. So. The purpose of those cutoffs in the middle of the race is to make sure that teams make enough progress to see the entire course in the day. Um, 
what we don't want to happen is say a team, let's just pretend we start on a trek and maybe there's one really hard uh, navigation point on that trek. We don't want teams spending six hours to try to find one checkpoint and then they only have two hours left to do a paddle and a bike and maybe they wouldn't even like make it back to the finish line. Um, so we put those mid-race cutoffs in place so that we'll help those help kind of coach all the teams to make enough progress on the course so that they can see the whole thing. Um, and that might mean that you skip a couple checkpoints earlier in the race. Um, and I mean, you won't get credit for those checkpoints, which is kind of a bummer, but it just gives you um, some information on how much or how long the entire course takes so that you can make it back to the finish line on time and seeing the whole thing. Um, so make sure somebody, preferably everybody has a watch. Um, this is like the one night that I'm not wearing one, um, but make sure everybody has a watch that they, you can pay attention to what time it is, and making sure you're making progress towards those cutoffs. Um, and then just kind of plan for things to go wrong. Um, and maybe not wrong, like catastrophic wrong, but things are not going to be perfect. Like they really never are. Um, that's kind of like maybe what's so appealing about adventure racing is that, that it's never perfect. And it's always about the teams that, um, you know, like take those challenges and take those, um, mistakes or whatever things that go wrong and just learn to like roll with it. They fix it as soon as possible and they just keep on moving on towards the finish line. Um, and that's, what's just so cool about the sport of adventure racing is it's just a combination of you know, your physical fitness, your problem solving ability, your navigation ability, your teamwork, like it's just so many interesting factors that really, I don't think any other sport combines um, in the same way. So just expect things to go, not how you planned them. Expect the unexpected. Great, great. You know, a, a flat tire on a bike gonna happen mm -hmm. to probably 20 to 30% of the teams out there. That just happens. But it's a team. It's a team. It's a team challenge. Don't just everybody sit down and watch the one guy that has the flat tire. It's like you know everybody work together to get the tools out. Somebody can start pre-inflating the tube while the other people are getting it out and turn it into a, a NASCAR pit stop. Um, you know little things like that, um, and just kind of work together as a team to get through adversity is the best thing. That's what I love. That's what everybody loves about adventure racing is, is it's just how to, it's a good problem solving challenge. Right. Like on your feet the whole time, figuring out what to do to overcome one, two, three, a hundred different things that go wrong. Like you just never know. Um, and you know, when those things go wrong, um, kind of fall back on those lessons of teamwork that we talked about, uh, last week of communication making sure that you're talking to everybody about you know what's happening. If you're starting to feel hungry and you're out of food, talk about what's happening. If you um, like you need to poop really bad and you need to find a place immediately, like tell your, your teammates what's happening. Um, just you know all that kind of stuff is you're gonna fix all of those problems faster when you communicate. Um, and just accept that that's part of the sport is things going wrong and it's not, you know, let's let's go back to the flat tire example. Like, you get a flat tire, it's not time to be like, oh, we got a flat tire, no one else has one of these, we're screwed, our race is ruined. Like, pity parties don't get you anywhere. Um, so just, you know, it might be really tempting to like watch your competition ride by and get down on yourself, but just like Earl said, just turn that flat tire into a team fixing exercise and get back on the course as soon as you can. Um, and maybe you'll have some like renewed motivation to go chase down those teams that passed you. Right, they might be a quarter mile ahead of you and they have a flat tire just because there's something that was causing flats in the road, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's just, or they get lost or, you know, there's just so many, you're never out. You're never out. You're never out. <laughs> or, like, or there's never a guarantee you're gonna get there. So, you know, it's just, Right. Just keep moving. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see. Yeah, dang, Randy with the like highly educational comments here. I'm just I need to read this one out loud. Start. Go until you have a problem. Solve it. Continue. Repeat. 
Uh, <laughs> let me, let's repeat that again. Start, go until you have a problem, solve it, continue, repeat. That's your five step plan for a successful adventure race. Um, and yeah, that's what it's all about. So um, that's kind of the end of our little chit chat tonight. Uh, like I said, if anyone has any last minute questions, like throw them in the comments and we'll get, we'll make sure we answer them tonight. Um, but yeah, so like I said, this is the, this is class number four of four for Adventure Racing 101 for the 2020 Castlewood eight hour adventure race in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, the next time we have the opportunity to learn about adventure racing as it relates to this race is on November 7th. Um, at 10 a.m. at Castlewood State Park here in St. Louis, um, we'll have a group training opportunity. Um, so that what that means is it's a four-hour window, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. We'll have uh, six to ten checkpoints out hung in the woods. Um, we'll give you a map at the start. Well, there really isn't even a start. We'll give you a map when you get there. And then you just have as much time as you want to go navigate to those checkpoints. Um, we set them up so that they're, you can trek to them or you can bike to them. And then if you want to bring your canoe uh, or kayak or something, we don't really have any paddling checkpoints, but you can use that opportunity to practice paddling. Actually, you could, I would paddle before or after the class, but use the, I mean, you can paddle whenever you want to, but if you want to actually get orienteering and navigational instructions, um, you know, the course is open from noon, from 10 to 2. Uh, I'd recommend getting there at least by noon uh, yeah. to give you your most time. But I would say the closer to 10, it gives you the most optimal window um, to do it because um, we'll have people start taking down the course at 2 o'clock just because Sharp. Uh, we just, that's our window um, and that's what it is. So. Um, and we'll also have, uh, we'll be there, we don't, t we just kind of hang out at the start finish line. And I mean, I say start finish, but like there's no timing, there's no results, like this is just group training. This is not... You're, it's an adult scavenger hunt that yes. people will be out participating in on a Sunday on, or Saturday under their own will is basically what it is. Yeah. Um, it's an informal practice section. Yep. And then we'll also have members from the St. Louis Orienteering Club available. Uh, I think we have like four or six people that RSVP'd for the November 7th session. So they'll be available to go with you and um, practice navigating. Um, I know last year it worked really well. I just remember uh, like we, in, in particular we had one four-person women's team and they kind of buddied up with a St. Louis Orienteering Club member and they would go and navigate and he would kind of follow behind and like coach. Um, but also like let them make their own mistakes and kind of figure things out on their own um, But just had that like kind of little bit of expert guidance when they needed it. So um, Just stuff like that. Like we're not here to you know, it's not like a one-on-one -on -one personal training session for four hours um, But we just want to have some extra hands and eyeballs available to help people learn the navigation process um, So that's the first one is on November 7th 10 a.m. Castlewood State Park um, and then the second one is November 21st. It's another Saturday, 10 a.m. That's at Ridge Meadows Elementary School. Um, both of those are in the Baldwin Wildwood area near St. Louis. Um, all right, let's see. Looks and, like. And then there's an orienteering meet, I think, this Saturday for people that want to go run around in the woods. Uh, yeah, Cliff Cave Park. St. Louis Orienteering Club is hosting a meet on the 31st. I don't know the time exactly, but Cliff Cave is a super cool park if you haven't been there. It's like really interesting, unique terrain to St. Louis. Um, kind of tricky navigationally, actually. So um, hopefully we can be there too. Um, I did have one question from Katie. Um, if, they bring, if you bring bikes to AR201, will there be a canoe to practice putting them into? Yes, there will be. Um, so yeah, bring your bikes, you can practice, if you, you'll figure out if you need to take them apart, like take the front wheel off, you can put them on their sides, just like all that stuff, like a little Tetris game, you can figure that out. Um, so yeah, that's kind of all we got for tonight and for AR 101 2020. Um, it's been super awesome, thanks everybody for being so 
um, supportive and engaged with our virtual format. Um, we're coming to you from our basement um, in St. Louis, so um, it's not ideal, but I just really appreciate everybody's flexibility and ability to navigate, or navigate, ability to adapt. Um, you know, this is a problem and we're solving it this way. So i um, super excited to see you guys next month. Um, oh yeah, one more thing, masks are required um, at the AR201 um, if you're within six feet of another person. So just, that's just the policy. Um, so yeah, see you hopefully at uh, November 7th or the 21st. Otherwise, um, packet pickup December 4th. It's gonna be awesome. Thank you. All right, see you guys later. Have a great night.